The men and women of the United States Armed Forces. Uncle Sam wants them, but not if they're gay. I'd put a lot of my energy into, you know, four years of training. And it was just hard to give all that up. The military's ban on homosexuals. Today, some members of Congress took issue with that. That discrimination must come to an end. Tonight, a unique disclosure from one of the Navy's elite. Tonight, an officer and a gentleman reveals that he's also gay. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. You're going to meet a young man tonight who could very easily have been a model for a U.S. Navy recruiting poster. Just the sort of young man, in fact, that the Navy would use as an example of what it's looking for. Smart, resourceful, clean-cut, and courageous. This young man, however, is also gay. So you can strike smart, resourceful, clean-cut, and courageous. Because of his sexual orientation, those qualities and his excellent record in the Navy will probably not be enough to save his job. Because he is gay and going public with that information on this program tonight, having informed his commanding officer by letter this afternoon, the Navy will almost certainly move to dismiss him. The Pentagon, unfortunately, will not participate in tonight's broadcast, saying only that the Department of Defense doesn't comment on its policy banning homosexuals. Last February, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Colin Powell, told the House Budget Committee that Homosexual behavior is inconsistent with maintaining good order and discipline in the military. So that's where we begin. Here's more now from Nightline correspondent Jackie Judd. The United States military, modern in every way, except one, no gays allowed. Now, some in Congress want to change that to force the Pentagon to drop its ban. What this law would say is you cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. President Bush's spokesman refused comment on the proposed legislation. Democrat Bill Clinton calls the ban a quaint little rule that needs to be done away with. I think there ought to be a presumption in favor of Americans being able to serve their country. The Pentagon's defense of its prohibition has been marked by inconsistencies and the rejection of studies friendly to the other side. A report commissioned by the Defense Department but never released warned that the military cannot indefinitely isolate itself from society. A second report concluded that the fitness of homosexuals to serve was as good, if not better, than the average heterosexual. And an internal memo from an officer at Army headquarters proposed abolishing the ban, but that memo didn't get anywhere. Military leaders once maintained that gays were a security risk. That's been disavowed and replaced by issues of privacy and maintaining order. To introduce uh, a group of uh, individuals who are proud, brave, loyal, good Americans, but who favor a homosexual lifestyle and put them in with heterosexuals who would prefer not to have somebody of the same sex find them sexually attractive, put them in close proximity, ask them to share the most private of their facilities uh, together, the bedroom, the barracks, uh, the latrines, the showers. Uh, I think that's a very difficult problem to give the military. A former Defense Department official in the Reagan administration says that's a smokescreen. The military basically feels it would be against their self-image that <clears throat> the macho man having uh, gays and lesbians in the force would not be in keeping with the image they see of themselves. And the Legion of Merit that I was awarded in 1972. Chuck Magnus rose through the ranks before retiring from the Army in 1981. Soon after, he came out of the closet. It didn't have anything to do with how I served and how I performed in the military. I wasn't being evaluated on my sexual performance. I was being evaluated on how I performed as an officer. And I have a, an excellent record. Magnus comes from a military family. His father commanded a black unit and resisted integration. The son says today's debate has a familiar ring. It's the same, same argument. We can't mix because it'll break down the good morale and discipline of the, of the forces. And that wasn't true. That didn't hold water 
with blacks. It didn't hold water with women, and I don't think it'll hold water with homosexuals. It's an analogy lost on Colin Powell, the first black Joint Chief of Staff. In a letter to Congresswoman Schroeder, Powell wrote, skin color is a benign, non-behavioral characteristic. Sexual orientation is perhaps the most profound of human behavioral characteristics. Skin color uh, doesn't dictate uh, behavior. I'll buy that. But sexual orientation doesn't dictate behavior. I'm not wearing a dress. I'm not being, um, uh, I, I don't run around chasing, chasing men. Uh, I'm not, I'm 52 years old. What, I mean, <laughs> I'm beyond uh, anything like that. But I am homosexual. I can't be in the service. Although the stereotype of gay men and women flaunting their sexuality is at the core of the military's concern, the fact is tens of thousands of gay men and women serve in the military, and most without incident. The performance of homosexuals in the military has been superb. And the reason we know that is every time one of these people is forced to leave the service, their record becomes part of the uh, judicial process, putting them out. And in every case, their record has been uh, above average. Sociology professor Charles Mosco says it's precisely because gays must stay in the closet that military discipline is maintained. We're talking not about gays in the military, which of course exist. We're talking about allowing declared and open homosexuals uh, to uh, s join and remain in the military. That would be quite a different kind of uh, social chemistry than the present s situation where homosexuals who do serve in the military are very discreet about it. I think if they change the regulation, it wouldn't be like uh, gays and lesbians would suddenly just come out and tell, tell their comrades, I'm gay. Um, they would use their judgment and come out to their colleagues as they felt comfortable. Karen Stupski, ROTC at Harvard, later entered the Navy. She confessed to her superior she was a lesbian and within months was discharged. I did care about my ship and about the people that I worked with. And I'd put a lot of my energy into, you know, four years of training. And it was just hard to give all that up. About a thousand Karen Stupskis are discharged every year. Those who support that policy argue the military is no place for social experimentation. Those on the other side return to the argument that at the time, integrating blacks and promoting women was also considered social experimentation. This is Jackie Judd for Nightline in Washington. When we return, we'll talk live with a Navy officer whose opposition to the military policy on gays takes on a personal dimension tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Navy Lieutenant Tracy Thorne is in many ways a model flight officer. He was first in his class in flight training, received the highest grades of the year, and winning Top Gun honors. He was fourth in his class at Navy Aviation Officer Candidate School, earning the label of an officer and a gentleman. But tonight he has chosen to shatter the mold by disclosing that he is something the military doesn't tolerate. Lieutenant Tracy Thorne is with me here in our Washington Bureau. And if you're going to tell folks that you're gay, there are easier ways to do it than coming on a network news program. Why, why this way, Tracy? Well, I really feel that this is a time, uh, time for change. I think the political climate is ripe. And uh, I've just seen too much discrimination. Uh, I see you know, thousands of people a year that are kicked out of the Navy for something that is beyond their control. It's what they're born as. It's what they are, the core of their, of their human being. And uh, it's not based on what they do. It's based on what they are, and I feel like the discrimination is wrong, and uh, it's time to change it. Why is it that, that you feel, I mean, you, you could have done this in a much more subtle way. You probably could have even done it and stayed in the Navy if you had kept real quiet about it. I mean, I, I am sure that there are gays in the military and people know about it, but as long as they don't make too much of it, they're able to stay in the service. You've chosen not to do that. By doing that, you don't, you don't create any change. I mean, what I'm trying to do is, uh, is show people that you can be gay, you can do your job, and your friends, you know, fellow officers in the Navy have no problem. The people that I've come out to 
have no problem with, uh, with my homosexuality. They back me up 100% on this. And, and to live life in the closet isn't accomplishing anything. It's, uh, it's not showing America that the people they work with every day are gay. What was it that was most difficult to you about it? Uh, and and uh, in terms of your being gay, that, that puts you in a position in which you obviously must hear a lot of your colleagues in the, in the naval setting. I'm sure there are a lot of gay bashing jokes, as there are in, in almost every male-oriented kind of culture. Well, there is. There's a mild sense of homophobia everywhere. And, and it, it hurts inside every time you have to see your, your friends are, are joking around. They don't mean it uh, in a way to really hurt you, but, but they don't realize what they're doing. And, and I constantly see jokes uh, you know, against gays and homosexuals. And, and it, it really hurts inside when, when they don't realize that, that they're affecting you. And they don't even realize that, that you as, your friend, as their friend are being hurt by it. Now, as you, 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 you've mentioned that you have told some of your friends in the Navy, Yes, sir. How, how recently or how long ago? Well, I, uh, I started a process uh, in the last uh, few years, and uh, all my friends in the Navy have backed me up 100% on this. I have not had a single person turn their back on me. They've, uh, they've been great, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. They've, uh, they've always, you know, every one of them said, my door's always open for you. But you've looked into the legalities of this, and you don't really have any doubts about what's going to happen to you. I mean, the, the Navy, given the current rules, is obliged to dismiss you. Yes, sir. I sure are. And I expect that when I return to my command tomorrow, that uh, my commanding officer will follow through with his duties and uh, start an administrative separation proceedings against me. And what do you expect will happen then? Well, I'm going to, uh, they may ask me to resign my commission, but I'm, uh, I'm going to refuse that. And uh, there'll be an administrative uh, board convened when I request it, and uh, that time we'll uh, proceed with a, uh, with a case that we can put forward, and hopefully on, uh, on uh, my record and the record of several other people before me, we can uh, try and get this ban overturned. You have, I mean, is, is there any kind of blemish on your record at all? No, sir. None that I'm aware of. Anything but the best kind of record? I mean, I, I gave some of your background there. Those pretty much the highlights? Yes, sir. On what basis, then, are they going to uh, dismiss you? Simply because you are homosexual and have announced it? Yes, sir. Not on anything that I've done. Uh, or anything, uh, it's going to be based solely on my declaration that I am homosexual. You and I spoke in my office before, and you said you were under the impression that the Navy would probably like this to transpire as smoothly and as easily as possible. Uh, and if you would go quietly, you'd probably get an honorable discharge, no problem in getting out of the service. Yes, sir. You don't want to go quietly. No, I think by going quietly, it everything just stays bottled up inside the Pentagon the way they want it to be. They want to keep this quiet because I really feel the Pentagon is worried. They're, they're afraid that this policy is going to change if the public realizes how many people are discharged every year and how much this is costing the Pentagon. It's an enormous cost to them. I'm saying $300 million was spent since 1974 on expelling homosexuals from the military. It's an enormous cost and people's lives are ruined every year by this. Thousands of people each year are discharged. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go quietly. Uh, you know, I love the Navy, and uh, I have nothing bad to say about it, but I have to stand up on this issue. When you hear General Powell, who is a decent and sensitive man, saying, as you heard him say before that committee, that it's something that adversely affects the discipline of the military, can you understand what he's talking about? Quite clearly, as long as someone is, as you have been, gay but very quiet about it, that can have no effect on the, on the discipline of the Navy. But if the rules were to change, and let's say there were some people then who were slightly more uh, open in their affections toward one another, men walking around hand in hand as frequently we see in civilian life, can you see where that would make a difference in the military? Well, it's certainly going to make a difference. I mean, going back to Colin Powell, I mean, I know that in the 1940s when Harry Truman integrated uh, blacks into the services fully, there were people who were saying there is no white man that will follow a bl uh, black man's order. I mean, how ironic that today we are all taking orders in the military from a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who's an African American. Th this argument cannot stand. And uh, I mean, I have the utmost respect for uh, General Powell, and, and I hope that he will uh, be able to, to look on this and, and move forward for a change.
All right, Tracy, hang in. We've got to take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by the congresswoman who today introduced a measure to open the military to gays, Representative Pat Schroeder. Representative Pat Schroeder is a member of the House Armed Services Committee. Legislation she introduced today would end discrimination against homosexuals in the military. Congresswoman Schroeder joins us in our Washington studios. Uh, is Lieutenant Thorne the young man to make a difference here? I think so. I, I think every taxpayer has to stop and think, look, here is a young man. He's invested, we've invested heavily in his background. He's at the top of his class. What in the world are we doing? We're not talking about his behavior. We're talking about only his sexual orientation. And when I hear um, General Powell and others, what they're really doing is only perpetuating the sexual stereotypes that people can't control their behavior and therefore everything would be lost. That's baloney. My bill only says you can't discriminate on sexual orientation, but the behavior rules are the same for everyone. So I think he's been awfully courageous. I think taxpayers um, are going to speak out. And we have a poll that the Human Rights Group just finished that shows 81% of Americans don't feel people like Tracy should be dismissed for this. And so, you know, hopefully Washington will catch up with what the average American thinks. They're a lot fairer, I Actually, think. Actually, you, you, you sort of got ahead of me a little there, Congresswoman Schroeder, because I was about to mention uh, the trend in polls over the last few years, and they have been going steadily up from about 51% to 60% to 65%, I think, of those who say uh, having homosexuals in the, in the military uh, is all right. Usually, the military has been ahead of the public in terms of making social progress. Certainly, it did so with regard to blacks. I think probably blacks moved ahead a lot faster within the military than they've been able to do in civilian life. Why do you think the military is lagging behind the public on this one? I guess what I'd say is usually the military lags, but once it decides that it's going to integrate, with the women or, or blacks or whatever, um, once you get those top-down pressures, they move, and they move very fast, and then it does become fair. But it's cracking the mind mindset up at the top to say, we're going to do this. And once they decide they're going to do it, they can do it, and they, they put the orders out there, and everybody marches, and everybody salutes the orders, and on it goes. Whereas the rest of society, it takes a lot longer for it to trickle down or to come up from the bottom either way. It, it becomes much slower. So usually the military is a little behind, but then once it catches up, it races out in front. Furthermore, I think it's only fair. I mean, what does the Pledge of Allegiance say? It says, it's, uh, this is for everybody, liberty and justice for all. That's what they're fighting for. And everybody ought to be participating equally, I think, in that. What kind of, what kind of support, what kind of opposition are you getting uh, among your colleagues? Well, we had very good support today, Ted. We had a, a strong cross-section of Americans from all sorts of different states. We would hope to find a Senate sponsor. I'm a little nervous about whether this can get passed this year in a presidential year. But I'll tell you the things that really woke people up. You know, this war woke people up. I'll tell you what made me angry. A lot of us have been trying to get the President of the United States to change this. But he never did. So now we've decided we're going to just put it in legislation and we're going to try very hard to get it through as soon as possible because of the Gulf War. You see, we had all these memos that were sent out saying, if you know gays and lesbians in the war, leave them alone. We'll deal with it after the war is over. Now, I'm really sorry. If we're saying these people make fine soldiers so they can be out there and put their life on the line, but the minute the war's over, in peacetime, we can't tolerate them. That's absolutely backwards of how the military is supposed to work, and I think that's why the Pentagon isn't here tonight. They can't I, explain that. I just want to jump in for a moment because I want to spend the last minute or so with, with Tracy Thorne again. What's been the most difficult thing about this so far? I guess the most difficult thing is that 
I'm giving up something in the Navy most likely that is uh, something I really enjoy doing. And uh, I don't want to give it up, but I really feel that it's time to, uh, to stand up and say this is wrong. And what is the thing you're most afraid of? Well, it would be easy to say that I'm most afraid of going back to see my skipper tomorrow. But what really scares me is uh, the fact that I may not be heard on this, that people aren't going to listen and uh, that nothing's going to get accomplished. Um, you know, prejudice is, is wrong. And uh, I, even though most Americans here don't, don't back this up, no matter how unanimous prejudice is, no matter how many people believe in it, I mean, prejudice can never be validated by unanimous consent. Tracy Thorn, thanks very much for being with us. Congresswoman uh, Schroeder, thank you for joining us this evening. I'll be back uh, with a word on tonight's primaries in just a moment. Just a quick footnote now on late results in the presidential primaries in two states. In Oregon, ABC News projects that Bill Clinton is the winner over Jerry Brown in the Democratic primary, and that George Bush will be the Republican winner. The same outcome can be expected in Washington state. But that does not mean that the winners should breathe easily. Our exit polls in Oregon show a sizable number of write-in votes in both parties for undeclared candidate Ross Perot. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been Nightline. If you wish a video cassette version of Nightline, the cost is $14.98 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. If you wish a printed transcript of this or any Nightline broadcast, please send $4 to Journal Graphics. 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 303-831-9000. Nightline. Is a pre Lifting the ban on gays in the military. It was a campaign pledge but now it's looking easier said than done. I intend to keep my commitment. It's going to end his honeymoon very, very quickly with Congress and the American people if he insists on going forward with this. The presence of homosexuals in the force would be detrimental to good order and discipline for a variety of reasons, principally relating around the issue of privacy. Tonight, the issue that's testing President Clinton's political mettle and the limits of change. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Koki Roberts. It's his second week in office and he's fast approaching a second political landmine. Last week, the flap over his choice for attorney general exploded. This week, President Clinton's promise to allow homosexuals to join the armed services might be blowing up in his face. Top military brass have made their opposition to changing the policy well known. Now they're getting support from key players on Capitol Hill, and the public is beginning to weigh in as well. The Joint Chiefs met with their new commander-in-chief for almost two hours today, and reportedly the subjects of Somalia, Iraq, and Bosnia were never raised. And while Chairman Colin Powell went to the White House, his office fielded phone calls, 648 against lifting the ban on gays, 21 calls for the change. Calls supporting the ban flooded the White House switchboard as well. Senate Armed Services Committee Chairman Sam Nunn announced he would hold hearings on the matter so that all sides could be heard. And some Republicans threatened to tie up the beginning of this congressional session with legislation giving the ban against gays the force of law. Still, President Clinton vows to keep his campaign promise, hinting he will make some changes in policy soon, perhaps as soon as this week. Here's Jeff Greenfield. <laughs> There were smiles and laughter today when President Clinton and Defense Secretary Les Aspen met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the White House, which just goes to show that appearances can be deceiving. Thank you all very much. Lights, thank you, please. When the cameras went away, the conversation turned to what will likely be the most explosive public policy debate of the young administration, Bill Clinton's unequivocal pledge 
to end the ban on homosexuals in the military and the military leader's unequivocal opposition to that idea. But I intend to keep my commitment. But Defense Secretary Aspen, the man charged with carrying out that promise, was clearly signaling yesterday that a swift Clinton order, the stroke of the pen approach, might be a journey through a political minefield. If Bill Clinton were to write an executive order today eliminating ba the ban on, on homosexuals and the homosexuality on, in the military, Congress could tomorrow vote a piece of legislation that restores the ban. In fact, a memo from Aspen to the president that was leaked to the press over the weekend argued that Clinton could count on only 30 Senate votes out of 100 for his position. And today, Senate voices on both sides of the aisle were warning the president of trouble. And it's going to end his honeymoon very, very quickly with Congress and the American people if he insists on going forward with this. I think something's fundamentally flawed when the people, the men and women in the military, uh, have an issue that is uh, a vital to them, that affects them, and they never have been heard from. And I believe they ought to be heard from. What makes the issue so explosive is that the conflict is not rooted in the stuff of normal political divisions. It's not about who benefits from a government program, or who gets the new highway, or who pays more taxes. Instead, it is about fundamental questions of justice, fairness, morality, privacy, and order. Areas where the normal political give and take gives way to bedrock questions of right and wrong. For the thousands of gays in the military, the issue is one of basic human decency. Tracy Thorne is facing expulsion after publicly declaring that he is gay. When a heterosexual man comes to work, he wears his wedding band. He talks about his family. He talks about what he did the night before when he went home. I, as a homosexual, can't do that. I can't bring anything into the workplace that represents my life. Very often, I would have to uh, pretend that I had a girlfriend or something like that, and that was, uh, that was uncomfortable, it was untrue, and uh, I would like to just be able to be honest with people. I think people respect honesty. Supporters of repealing the ban point to 1948, when President Harry Truman's executive order to end racial segregation in the armed forces was met with heated opposition including opposition from General Dwight Eisenhower. Ike told the Senate committee that with integration, quote, the Negro is going to be relegated to the minor jobs and is not going to get his promotion because the competition is too tough, unquote. Current concern over gays is equally irrational, says Representative Barney Frank, one of two openly gay members of the House. No one is asking that anybody be given any license to engage in behavior on base, on duty, anywhere in active military service that's inappropriate. People are simply talking about respect for their privacy in their own private time. But that is not how the military sees it. Colin Powell, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, flatly rejects any comparison between the racial segregation of the past and the current ban on gays. Well, homosexuality is a ben not a benign, sec uh, benign uh, behavioral characteristic such as skin color or uh, whether you're Hispanic or Oriental. It, it goes to one of the most fundamental aspects of human behavior, and I think it uh, does make a difference. I think it would be very, very difficult to accommodate that into the armed forces. I'd have a hard time. There's no way. Um, I'd have a hard time with someone homosexual living with me, uh, you know. And it's basically I'd bring that out onto the mission with me, me being an MP. Um, I'd have a problem if there was a scenario where there was blood involved. I could find a regulation somewhere that says I don't have to live with it, and I wouldn't live with it. I would get him out of the military for another reason. Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a straight fact. At the core of this feeling is the belief that homosexuality is not another lifestyle, but abnormal, perverse. Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis shows this tape to high-ranking officers to make his point. If a homosexual somehow could be celibate, which is very, very rare, then they could probably stay in the closet and never be discovered and served honorably. And probably there have been many that have. However, the majority of homosexuals define themselves by their behavior, which is by their sex acts, and as a result of that, we cannot tolerate that in the military. What makes the argument so complex is that gays by the thousands have served and fought in the military for centuries. 
The same officials who insist that gay men and women cannot serve side by side with straight men and women know that they do so today. Near Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, for example, social clubs that cater to gay Marines operate more or less openly. Gay men and lesbians have interacted and lived with straight men and women for many, many years. We have showered together, we have been on athletic teams together, we have done a whole lot of things together. But the military is one institution where even free societies have always recognized the need to limit freedoms that are guaranteed elsewhere. The conflict now is focused on this key issue. Is sexual orientation a trait that is no more significant than race or creed or gender, or is it a trait that, if openly acknowledged, would somehow pose a threat to the military's mission and to national security? I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline. When we come back, we'll be joined by an officer who has researched the subject of gays in the armed forces and says the ban should remain in force. And we'll be joined by a Navy flyer who was a top gun until he announced on this program that he's gay. Lieutenant Colonel William Greger is a former aide to the Joint Chiefs who retired in September. He spent the past four years analyzing the military's ban on homosexuals. Colonel Greger joins us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Last May, Lieutenant Tracy Thorne was a naval aviator with a spotless record and top gun honors. That changed when he came on Nightline to say that he's gay. His discharge proceedings are on hold, but his assignment now is dealing with hazardous waste. Lieutenant Thorne is in our Washington Bureau. Colonel Greger, we've just heard a discussion from, in Jeff Greenfield's piece about how there are already thousands of gays and lesbians in the military. What would be so terrible about allowing them to just tell the truth about their situation? Well, the question is, <clears throat> really, and I think Barney Franks acknowledged it uh, tonight on, on Crossfire, that the large portion of the homosexual youth po uh, population, age 15 to 24, is seriously troubled. It has six times the suicide rate. Over 30 percent are involved with alcoholism or drug abuse. And over, <clears throat> over half of the adult homosexual males will contract hepatitis B uh, in their lives. Um, all these difficulties are, are related to, to their behavior. And it is also, of course, currently uh, against the law to commit homosexual acts in the, in the military. Colonel uh, Gregor, I don't think you can seriously expect us to believe that homosexual children are born with a predisposition for uh, suicide. What we have is a society and a military that tells these children that they're worthless, they have no place in society, that they're an abomination, will be cast out from their families and religion, and of course when they have all that being thrown at them, they're going to be likely to become depressed and more suicidal. I think it's an incredible tragedy that we have a society where 5,000 gay and lesbian youth each year take their lives. We need to address that, tell these children that there's a place in the world for them and that they can join the armed forces one day and be proud of who they are. Are. Well, if, 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 you, if you agree with that, l Lieutenant, and, and that's certainly a hypothesis, uh, would you agree then that we would have to identify them as they entered the military so we could provide the proper assistance that they require? Sir, I don't believe that they are going to need assistance. I think all they need is a society that tells them that they have equal rights, not special rights, but equal rights to succeed and, and, uh, and excel in all their part, parts of life. And that's all that we're going to need. We don't need to identify their sexuality. We don't want to wear our sexuality on our shoulder. I'm disgusted at the fact that I have to wear my sexuality on my shoulder to convince Americans that gays and lesbians are just like them. We're normal people. They're sons and daughters. They're doctors and lawyers. And yes, they're military men who are fighting and dying for them every day, just as there are people in Somalia right now that are gay and lesbian who are fighting for our country. Colonel Gregor, I, I, again, back to the experience question. Uh, you, you're citing studies, but, but you have the experience of gays in the military. And has your experience with them been that they have committed suicide, that they have been alcoholic, that they have been promiscuous? Well, it's an interesting question because it's essentially an uncountable population. What, <clears throat> what the experience is is, is limited to, to those that have been identified under this provision of the regulation. There is no particular reason why they could not have been discharged under other provisions of the regulation, such as, as uh, having problems with alcohol abuse and never revealed their identity. But here, here let's l just look at, at uh, uh, some of the discharges for, for homosexuals. 30% of the homosexuals report themselves because they're seeking discharge 
and 54 percent are reported through reports of their lovers. Only about 16 percent are <coughs> exposed by their own actions. Now the question is, if a commander receives a report from a lover that an individual is committing an act of sodomy, which is against the law, isn't it the commander's duty to investigate that report? Lieutenant Thorne? Ma'am, as far as I'm concerned, the sodomy laws need to be repealed. These are laws that were brought about years and years ago. They are no longer in force in most places. And in the military especially, it is unjust the way the sodomy laws were originally conceived to apply both to heterosexuals and homosexuals and now are, apply and are only enforced against homosexuals. There is a lot of heterosexual sodomy that's going on out there that is, it, the laws are never enforced against. And I, I truly believe that what goes on between two consenting adults behind closed doors is not the government's business. We're not talking about sodomy here. Though. We're talking about a military that is discriminating against people solely on their sexual orientation. We're not talking about conduct. We're talking about a military that is throwing people out simply because they say that they're gay and they want to be able to serve their country without having to lie about who they are. Colonel Gregor, what about that double standard? We hear a lot about that. that they, we've certainly heard a lot in this past year about heterosexual abuse in the military, uh, the whole tail hook scandal, all of that. Uh, is, is there any reason why the conduct standard could not be used for both homosexuals and heterosexuals? Uh, this is the problem. The tail hook scandal is a scandal that results because commanders failed to investigate reports of, 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 of the illegal acts. The problem that the lieutenant points out is indeed a problem. Commanders are regarding acts that are, that are criminal under the code as, as not being worthy of their investigation. If you teach an officer corps to ignore acts that Congress has prescribed within the code, then discipline is broken. But these are acts, are they not, Colonel, as opposed to just orientation? We're interested in behavior. Every, our attempt is to identify those persons whose behavior will, will, will bring them in conflict with the law. We ask incoming kids whether they've, they've uh, used drugs uh, as adolescents. We exclude them. We exclude uh, individuals who have uh, juvenile uh, petty theft convictions. And in every one of those instances, sir, it is something that has to deal with their ability to perform a job. Sexuality, on the other hand, has no bearing on whether we can do our job. If you're short, you're fat, you're out of, out of shape, the military can discriminate against you because it interferes with your capacity to do the job. Sexuality, on the other hand, has no capacity for, uh, to uh, interfere with you doing your job, and we should be able to serve our country. And as far as uh, the sexual conduct that you're talking about, I think that the new administration, the Secretary of Defense, has shown that they have an enormous resolve to bring forth education and set strong conduct I standards. Don't. Strong conduct standards for homosexuals and heterosexuals that will apply for all. And we're going to have to have an enormous amount, I know it sounds cliche, but we're going to have to have an enormous amount of education in, in the service and out of the service to show that gays and lesbians are is just like heterosexuals and Lieutenant, that... Isn't the, problem, isn't the problem you're citing the problem of how we enforce discipline? Well, we will get Soldiers. to that problem. We will get to that problem and see if we can find a, a halfway point when we can continue our discussion in a moment. We're back with Navy Lieutenant Tracy Thorne and Lieutenant Colonel William Gregor. We're hearing reports from uh, the White House, uh, Lieutenant Thorne, that, that the President might do something sort of in between, halfway, not quite lift the ban, but say that the questionnaire for recruitment will no longer have the question about uh, sexual orientation and that, the, uh, uh, that there will not be prosecution of homosexuals in the military. Would that do it for you? Yes, ma'am, it sure would. I think that uh, the president has really come up with a political masterpiece here that is going to satisfy a lot of people's needs. Though gays are not out there saying, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. We're, all we're trying to do is say, look, we want to serve our country. And the president is willing to pro provide a plan to, to gays. It's will he's willing to provide a plan to the military and saying, let's sit down and talk about this. Let's work out the problems, and I'm willing to let you guys take the ball and run with it. The problem is we need to really emphasize here that if the president does not deal with this 
in a very quick fashion, the courts are going to do it. And if the military doesn't want to work with the President of the United States on this, the courts are going to ram it down their throat, and the military is going to have no say-so on how to implement this. So I think that everyone should be happy about the fact that we're moving forward on this, that people want to work together. The military is being included on this and are, are going to be able to provide a plan that will meet everybody's needs. What um, about that, uh, Colonel Gregor, and, and what about that question of the courts? Well, I... I personally won't speculate on the courts. I think the courts would support uh, the, the military if the military presented a, uh, a, a, the, the case for, for the standards that we maintain. I think a question here comes uh, with respect to uh, not asking the question has to do with who's responsible for the welfare of, of the soldiers. Uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant Thorne, uh, yes, Barney sir. Franks. Barney Franks told me tonight that although 60% of all AIDS victims are homosexual men, I should not be concerned about the military blood supply. Uh, no, sir, since AIDS. Only, since only 30% of the AIDS victims are drug users, should we permit uh, sir, young drug offenders to join the military? Colonel, with all due respect, AIDS is not a problem in the armed forces of the United States. AIDS is not a gay disease. It is a disease that affects everybody in this country, everywhere from Midwestern housewives to Northeastern schoolgirls. Everybody in this country is affected by AIDS. If you Lieutenant want to start, Thor sir, Lieutenant sir, please do not interrupt me, sir. If you, if you want to start excluding people on the basis of AIDS, the first group you're going to have to exclude is a single black male because they are the highest risk group today. Lesbians are the lowest risk group out there, so that's half your problem right there. And to get into the armed forces of the United States, you have to be screened for the HIV antibody, and on an annual basis, you are rescreened and rescreen so AIDS is not a problem in the military well, sir. Lieutenant Thorne let's, yes, let's 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 talk about facts although the secular trend has increased the rate of HIV in society it has in fact been going down within the military till now that it's less than one in a thousand that is not a result of accident yes sir that's that shows the military policy yes sir that shows but it's the not the result purely of testing what, there is a delay between six months to a year to identify sir, there are, positive. Sir, there test. are uh, over 100,000 gays and lesbians serving in the military, and I think you can see from what the, the statistics you just showed, AIDS is not a problem in the military. You cannot count the 100,000 in the military. I suggest that the, that the low rate of infection in the military result of excluding drug abusers and homosexuals. But <laughs> Lieutenant Thorne, there is an, another question that uh, Colonel Powell, uh, that uh, General Powell has raised, which is that unlike with the issue of race or sex, uh, the sexual orientation for some people really is a moral question. What do you say to the people in the military who really have a moral uh, repulsion about uh, homosexuality. I understand that completely, ma'am. I don't agree with it. When I went back to my squadron, I expected to be rejected by my squadron mates, rejected by the people that work for me. I had a pet, my leading petty officer and the enlisted men who work for him that work for me came up to me and said, we have no problem following your orders. And people may have problems working with gays. People may have problems working with Jews. People may have problems working with blacks. But they do it and they do it because the country demands they do it. The discrimination in this country is not tolerated. You're supposed to check your discriminations at the door. Sure, there are people out there who have uh, bigoted ideas, but it's not going to be tolerated in the armed forces of the United States anymore, and it's time for us to move on as the Americans we are, a great country, and, uh, and take our strengths from the diversity in our population. Colonel Gregor, is it discrimination that can be tolerated? Oh, absolutely. It's not discrimination at all. Uh, anybody, you know, I can remember How when can I was... How can you say it's not discrimination, sir? Right. You're taking now, my... Did, did he, you asked him not to interrupt you. Yes, ma'am. I, when I was studying constitutional law in the Yale Law School in 1972, I guarantee you there wasn't a single student or a faculty member that thought exclusion from the military service was somehow a deprivation of liberty. Okay, that's it. On that, on that word, we will have to close. Thank you very much, Colonel Gregor, Lieutenant okay. Thorne. Thank I'll you be very back much, in a moment. That's our report for tonight. I'm Koki Roberts in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. If you wish a video cassette version of Nightline, the cost is $14.98 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.